Welcome in everyone to Broadcaster Hour. I'm Roger Hoover alongside Kyle Crooks and this is week two in a row. We are not truly having a live episode for you because by this point I have been married and I'm now on a honeymoon and Alabama is playing football coming up tomorrow against Missouri. Kyle of course is worried about the Florida Gators and uh, Kyle it's a good time of the year football is here. Yeah, that's right. Noon kickoff against Ole Miss to, to kick it off. 11 a.m. Central Time. It's a tough way to start the season if you're the Florida Gators. But Roger, um, again, you know, stepping in the way of the podcast. He's on his honeymoon right now. He's having a time of his life. He's a married man, different man now. So uh, maybe one of these days I'll get married and I'll disrupt the podcast. But I'll give that about 15 years. Yeah, we got to get you a date first. <laughs> I mean, that's proven to be a pretty we tough step for you. We went over that on the you. Tim Brando podcast. Yes. <laughs> By lack of social life. I love that. Yeah, no Chateau Crooks like we have Chateau Brando (laughs) back in Louisiana with our good friend uh, Tim Brando. He's been one of our great guests that we've had on Broadcaster Hour. And last week we had a terrific episode called The Best of Preparation, looking at all the prep techniques, all the spotting boards, all the uh, different baseball things that people try to do to get ready for games. And, you know, that was one kind of common thread throughout a lot of episodes we have is talking with broadcasters about their preparation techniques. Another big common thread we have is is broadcasters talking about their influences. And certainly for me, and as we talked about in our introduction episode, uh, the one main reason I got in this business was I was a kid listening to Tennessee football and basketball and heard John Ward being an outstanding announcer for the University of Tennessee at really the tail end of his run. So really ever since then, I've been talking to broadcasters I've gotten to know, tell me more about John Ward. I want to hear more about John Ward. And Kyle, over the course of this year, whether it's been Bob Kessling, Mike Keith, even Courtney Lyle, Neil Price, some of the younger generation, John Ward's name keeps coming up. And that's why today we're going to share all the John Ward stories that we've had over the last few weeks. And I know it was those were special episodes for you because you went to Tennessee um, and and how just iconic John Ward was. And for me in the Northeast, there were there were different guys that that kind of fit that mold. Guys like Marv Albert, guys like John Sterling, who's still doing it 30 plus years later for the Yankees. But to see the reverence that you know you you mentioned yourself, Courtney Lyle, Neil Price, that that they have for. A guy like John Ward is incredible, and um, you know I've gone back and I've listened to to old tapes of John Ward. I, I think the Vol Network they replayed a lot of his old games that I, I've gone and I've listened back to. And somebody who was information first, who wasn't wasn't a flair guy, uh, wasn't somebody who was going to step in front of the broadcast with his own personality, um, but but had his phrases that live on forever in Tennessee football history, Tennessee basketball history. Um, and, and you listen to stories from guys like Mike Keith who say that, you know, they wouldn't be where they are without a guy like John Ward in their corner or somebody like Neil Price who first wanted to do this, not because of his love of the Reds and listening to baseball on the radio, but listening to John Ward uh, on the radio as a young kid. And now here he is in the SEC holding one of those football play-by-play chairs. So um, to, to see, again, the reverence you guys have for John Ward and, and what I've grown to learn through this podcast with John Ward of just how much of a legend that he was, Roger. Yeah, he certainly was. And you mentioned the big catchphrases he have. I think so many times now, especially this younger generation of broadcasters, if some of us have catchphrases, people are quick to be like, no, you don't need a signature home run call. You don't need a signature call doing this and that. And John would vary up his stuff, but he only, but he was so rare in the fact that he could use his touchdown call, give him six. And everybody instantly knew that was him. And it just, it wasn't trite. It wasn't one of these kind of over the top things built for sports center but it really connected with the Tennessee fans and I think that's why they continue using his phrases to this day and you know if people like it and they continue to say it back to you that's why he would continue using it and it's pretty cool that you know he had all of that stuff he was such a taskmaster but he made sure that people really had something to connect to with the broadcast and if I remember correctly going back to that Mike Keith episode and and the story he told about the Music City Miracle and how John Ward had, I think, written him a letter Mm -hmm. um, after that call. And it necessarily was not about the call that became iconic and one of the biggest calls in NFL history. It was about the field goal that the Bills had prior to that to put them up and the fact that Mike Keith had given that moment justice is what stood out to John Ward. Not necessarily being this big homer guy, but 
you know, saying the facts with the right amount of oomph behind it because, you know, that was a big moment. The Bills hitting that field goal was a giant moment. And Mike Keith giving it that that necessary pop that it needed was what stood out to John Ward. And I think that's what says a lot about his legacy again and what you guys have gone to learn from him is the professionalism that he brought to the role. And, and it's it's really cool to see guys who, you know, I'm sure if I talk to Mick Hubert tomorrow with Florida, the, the glowing reviews that he had for John Ward. And he necessarily, Roger, and you know this, wasn't a flowery guy from everything mm-hmm. I've heard. You know, he's more of a stoic personality. He was an all-business type of guy. But if you were in with him, you were in. And, um, you know, it, he built that Vol Network which is one of the more iconic radio networks in college sports. That's on the back of John Ward and everything that he's built uh, built along with other guys prior to John Ward. But um, just to, that's the dream, right? Is to one day get to the stature of a guy like John Ward and be revered the way that he is in in college sports broadcasting. Yeah, almost universally loved. And even by other fan bases, I think because of that fairness he had with everything he did, you know, he never said we when it came to Tennessee. He was just a really fair guy. And I know once I got to Alabama and started talking to Eli or different people around, you know, anytime I mentioned the name John Ward, they instantly, you know, had respect for him, talked about him glowingly. And, you know, Chris Stewart, one of my good friends who calls men's basketball for Alabama, I haven't talked to him about it, but he says bottom after big baskets in basketball. And I'm pretty sure he heard that from John Ward first. I don't know if he did, but uh, it's always a good tip of the cap. And when I filled in for Chris, a lot of times last year, I was saying bottom, not necessarily for Chris as a tribute to him as he was on the mend getting better. But a lot of times it was just John Ward. I don't use it much. I don't use many of Ward's phrases that much. I always want them to be kind of a big moment, kind of like Mike Breen when he says bang, he's only going to do it every now and then for emphasis. That's kind of how I am with bottom or some other stuff in basketball. But uh, he's just one of the best. And there are so many games on YouTube if you just Google John Ward or if you Google like 1994 Tennessee versus Alabama Tennessee Florida you'll be able to get the Vol Network radio call and uh, I encourage everybody to really listen to him work with his partner Bill Anderson in football and then on basketball he worked solely by himself from like the late 60s on so if you're a basketball broadcaster that's a solo announcer like Kyle and I well Kyle has a color analyst for basketball I do for some games don't for others but if you're ever if you're a solo basketball broadcaster really listen to some of John's full games tapes because he'll show you how to really be a reporter and really show you that you don't always need a lot of analysis for radio it's just the facts that's really most important yeah just the facts and and talking about from a technical play-by-play perspective Roger growing up listening to him are there things that you mentioned bottom and that phrase that Chris Stewart probably got from listening to John Ward and, and what you've got from listening to John Ward. Are there other things technically in your play by play that stand out from listening to John Ward as a kid? I think the main thing is energy and letting it build. Uh, we've heard Mike Keith talk about it before. There was nobody better at setting the scene than John Ward. And some of the most legendary Ward calls were not even truly game calls. But when the Pride of the Southland marching band is at Neyland Stadium doing their pregame show, and there's really almost nothing to talk about because pregame show's done. All you're getting ready to do is introduce the team, come onto the field. And Tennessee's lucky that it has a really dramatic entrance running through the team. But in those moments, getting ready for kickoff, he would do such a wonderful job about just setting the drama, setting the tone for the game, and doing it in a really memorable way. And uh, one of the best examples he had of that uh, was the 1990 game that Tennessee had against Florida. And he was, you know, getting into all the emotion and the spirit of this top 10 matchup on a Saturday in Knoxville. And he talked about the fact it is homecoming. He's like, you see cheerleaders from years past mingling with this year's cheerleaders because it is homecoming 1990 and as the crowd begins to roar and roar the deafening tones of 90,000 fans wherever you listen it's football time in Tennessee I still quote most of it to this day it had such an impact on me but he was so good at building the moments for the drama and I think that's the main thing I try to take with me as well and maybe that's the you know kid actor that I was in a lot of church musicals and stuff I've always tried to have a little bit of drama as I call a game especially you know basketball which you can kind of make 
to be a life or death situation sometimes, but just an innate sense of drama and just building for the big moments. And, uh, you know, as we've talked about with Neil before, you know, you don't have to lose it on every single play. It's not always game seven of the World Series, but when it is a huge moment, you've got to be able to nail it. And I think he did every time. And his last game, correct me if I'm wrong, was that Fiesta Bowl, right? Was mm-hmm. that national championship in 1998 so for him to to go out with that um and and again just the let and you see so many other legends in the sec that are growing and those that uh, are no longer with us that have been in the sec that are that are legendary just like john ward and you're seeing voices around the sec now that are becoming that legend you know we mentioned um you know a guy like eli gold in alabama mick hubert here in florida you know uh even a guy like bob kessling who took over for a legend is is now trying to build and and that's an interesting episode too when you talk about trying to fill the shoes of a legend which so many guys now are having to do at this point in time um, to not put too much pressure on yourself not try to be that guy but try to be your own guy but take certain things away from you know a legend Um, so for me it's been a learning process getting to learn some of the old school broadcasters and um, you know some of the other guys around the SEC that Neil Price mentioned Mm -hmm. in a prior episode you know um, Haywood Lefford in in, uh, Kentucky um, so many other guys, Larry Munson's another guy that, that stands out as well. So, so many different legends in the conference that, uh, you can go back, listen to old tapes and learn a lot of things. Certainly can. And that's why this is going to be a really fun, uh, remembrance of John Ward. It's our John Ward tribute coming up this week. And we'll even sprinkle in some John Ward, uh, touchdown calls, basketball plays coming up in between some of the guests coming up. So I think you'll really enjoy getting to hear more about the legendary voice of the Vols from the late sixties until 1998, John Ward. You hear the enthusiasm building. You see cheerleaders from years past joining this year's cheerleaders because it is homecoming 1990. And as the crowd begins to roar and roar and roar to the deafening cheers of 95,000 fans, the volunteers coming out to the gate in orange and white. The crowd comes alive. The volunteers are ready. It's time, ladies and gentlemen. It's football time in Tennessee. You mentioned spotting for John Ward. What can you tell us about his preparation when he got ready for a Tennessee football game? What was unique about John's booth? John was uh, John went to law school, got his law degree, never practiced law, but he prepared uh, the games as if he was going to go, you know, battle a court, uh, go to the Supreme Court and try and win a case. And I mean, he had he had a basically a, a, a board in front of him, clipboard in front of him. And he'd have a stack of notes about that big. And periodically during the game, he'd flip through those notes. Now, I bet he didn't use 30% of them, but he still had those notes in front of him. So you, And they were typewritten. So you knew all week all he was doing was making sure he had the information in case there was something came up during the broadcast, he would need that little nugget. But his preparation was unbelievable. He, he was the most prepared broadcaster I've ever been around. But that was his style. That's how he thought he needed to do things. And most of his pregame uh, and it was all scripted out because that's that's just the way he did it. And uh, I'm totally different from that. I can't script anything because I, I think you need to be more. I, I need to be more spontaneous. Uh, but there are other guys that script everything. And so it just depends on how, you know, if you're more comfortable uh, with that script in front of you, then do it. But if you're not, you know, you got to be again, you got to be yourself. And of course, John, not only doing Tennessee football, Tennessee men's basketball, as the Lady Vols basketball program got started, he started doing some of the games and then he passed that torch to you. Uh, What can you tell us about the early Lady Vol broadcast and then how you settle in uh, being the voice of the Lady Vols? Well, you know, it's funny because... uh, Again, I was working at WIBK radio, and I was a sports director there. And WIBK at that time did not have the Vol Network, so they weren't carrying the Tennessee games. But Bobby Denton, who was the, the PA voice at Neyland Stadium for all those years, a legendary voice at Neyland Stadium, wanted to get the games on WIBK. And so Pat Summit was coming in, and the year before, she'd gone to the Final Four, and there was some buzz or some interest about the Lady Vols. And so um, 
Bobby Denton decided he was going to do the next year was going to do the postseason games for the Lady Vols. And so uh, John Ward and A.W. Davis, they were the broadcast team. And I got to go along because I was the sports director at WIBK and I got to do the pregame and the halftime and all the postgame stuff. So it wasn't a big budget operation. We uh, basically, our first, back then you had to win, it was in the AIEW, and you had to win your state tournament. So everybody in the state of Tennessee that was a member of the AIEW got into a state tournament somewhere, whether it's Cookville or Knoxville or wherever it was, and you had to win that state tournament to advance to a satellite tournament for the AIAW. So uh, our first games we did in that postseason in 78, we had to go to Martin, Tennessee, and we took a van. We went all the way to Martin. We we won there. The next week, we had to go to North Carolina, uh, UNC, and we took the van to North Carolina. Well, we Lady Balls won both of those rounds, and now they're going. Now they're in the national tournament. So then we go to uh, Cleveland, Mississippi, Delta State. We got to fly there, and uh, so we drove down. We flew to Memphis, drove drove down to. Uh, to Cleveland, Mississippi, to Delta State. We did the game. They won, and then we go to Fordham. So in that first year, I mean, heck, I've been to North Carolina. I've been to Delta State. I go to Fordham up in New York. I'm thinking, this is a pretty good gig. So uh, we did the postseason games, and the next year they decided they'll do all the games, or as many as they could, on WIBK. So John started out, again, doing the games that first year. Well, that uh, the first full-time year that lasted about three games. And uh, uh, this is a funny story. I'll never forget. Uh, We had to play in Cleveland, Mississippi. Again, we played at Delta state, one of the early games in the season. And so uh, I flew down with the team and John was coming down the next day, the day of the game, because, you know, he's running his own advertising agency. So he's not going to travel with the team. He's going to fly down the day of the game and then fly back with the team. And so I'm in my hotel room that morning of the game, and I get this call, and it's from John. And I said, uh, I said, how are you doing? He said, well, I'm, I'm stuck in Atlanta. Bad weather. I'm stuck in Atlanta. I'm not going to be able to make it there tonight to do the game. So uh, you can do it by yourself, can't you? You, 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 know, you know what's going on. You know about the rosters. And I said, yeah, I know everything. Well, you just go ahead and do the You got the equipment. I said, yeah, I've got all the equipment. You just do the game. And uh, I'm, I'm going to turn around and get back, go back to Knoxville. I said, that's fine with me, John. And so I'm fired up. I'm going to be get to do my first basketball game. I'm 20, I don't know, 22 years old or something like that. And I'm thinking, this is going to be great, college basketball. And so I did the game, and I was thought I did okay, got through it, and got the score right and all those type of things. And so I go back to uh, the next day. Uh, I take the radio gear back, and so I take it over to, to Ernie Robertson's office there at UT. And uh, I go uh, – Ernie said, I got to do the game last night. Of course, he's editing some film. He didn't even look up. He said, yeah, that's what I heard. I said, yeah, it was, I said, it was, it was really a lot of fun. I said, yeah, I bet it was. He said, well, John couldn't make it because of the bad weather. He said, what? I said, yeah, John called me and said he was stuck in Atlanta. He said, no, he wasn't. He was at that phone right over there. That's where he called you from. <laughs> so, so I figured out pretty quick the job wasn't going to do both the men and the women for very long and so that's kind of how i got the lady ball job and uh, so i started doing their games and uh, you know i didn't treat it like women's basketball now back then it's a lot different than it is now in tennessee i mean back then a crowd of 100 people at stokely athletic center was a good night and uh, so you weren't doing it for the publicity and you weren't doing it for the money i think i got paid 15 bucks a game or something like that I did it for the reps and I didn't view it as women's basketball. I viewed it as college basketball and SEC basketball. And, um, and I got a lot of reps. I got to do a lot of games. I went all over the country with them. And, you know, little did I know at that time that I was going to be working with one of the legendary coaches in college basketball and Pat summit. I mean, back then she was Pat head and, um, and again, we're playing in Stokely. They just graduated from playing an alumni gym. And again, you know, one or 200 people a night was big time. I mean, that was big, big doing. So, uh, and, and that's kind of where you've got to start. I mean, you take any opportunity you get. Uh, I've told Roger this story before. Um, I was doing the Lady Vols and uh, I was, they had a broadcast ramp at Stokely Athletic Center way above the floor. And you look kind of down on top of it 
great perch to watch and, and do a game. And so I'd done, a, I'd done some lady ball games and I, you know, I thought I was pretty good. And I thought this was, this was going to work out really well. So I made a tape of one of my games. And uh, so the lady ball position was down on one end of the, the ramp and John's Ward's position was on the other side. And so we did a double hitter. The lady boss played the first game and the second game was getting ready to come up. And so right before John went on the air, I said, John, would you, would you mind listening to one of my tapes and kind of give me some critiques about things I could do better? Yeah, I'd be happy to, he said. And, uh, so I didn't hear, get the tape or anything. And so we happened to have another double header a couple weeks later. And I went up to him again, you know, after our game was over before he went on the air. And I said, John, did you have a chance to listen to my tape? And he said, yes, yes, I did. And he went to his briefcase and he opened it up. And I said, well, you know, did you get a chance to critique it? Yes, I did. I said, well, you know, anything I need to work on? And he said, try advertising and turned and walked away. So <laughs> he... He uh, did not give me a lot of confidence that I was going to be a successful broadcaster, but he sent a very powerful message to me mm -hmm. with that just try advertising quip was, hey, I'm not as good as I think I am, and I need to get better, and I need to work at this. And you're not just a naturally born broadcaster. You might have some traits. You might have some good qualities, but you really got to work at it. It's a craft, and you've got to learn the craft and you've got to get better at it and you've got to you've got to really try and improve some of the things you're doing you get into habits that you don't know you're doing and that's why you need other people to listen to your tapes and you need to listen to them as well so you're not repeating phrases uh, my wife caught me on one she said um, this is back a long time ago but she said i was using tonight in every sentence tonight the tennessee volunteers or tonight 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 she said Cut it out. I'm sick of hearing tonight. I didn't know I was doing it, but that's just, that's a, now if your wife picks it out, you know, it's bad. So, uh, but that's just, that's a little thing that you don't know you're doing it, but now you got to be conscious of it. And so you, you need the feedback and as painful as it might be at times, it's going to make you better. If you listen to what people say. Big hole opens up, get to the five. Working to the 20, Stutter stepping to the 25, breaking to the 30, outside to the 35, to the 40, to the 45, to the 50, cutting to the far sideline, down to the 45, to the 40, 35, 30, 15, 10, 5, 4, Jim Powell, right three. side 40, 45, 50, gets outside 45, 40, 35, 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 60 yards, Jeff Mike, now we've gotten to the John Ward portion of the show uh, because he was certainly one of my big heroes growing up in Tennessee. I know the same is for you as well. And I I'm curious, when you met him for the first time, did he quiz you on the county seats of Tennessee like he did me? <laughs> no, I got I got that later. He did that on the air. <laughs> oh, wow. He did that on the – he said to me one time um, – and I'm, I'm from East Tennessee, grew up in Middle Tennessee. When I got the Titans job, I had never been to West Tennessee. And for your audience who doesn't know like we do, Roger, Tennessee is really three states. Mm -hmm. Completely different terrain, different accents, different politics, different. I mean, everything is completely different. So on the air, he asked me about a particular county in West Tennessee that I think I had heard of. I don't know. And, uh, I mean, it was pretty humiliating. 
Because let's go back to the big orange scoreboard and standing by is a man who is going to tell you the county seat of O'Brien County, Mike Key. And I'm like, I have no... And so I had a pretty good response, so I was pretty pleased to be a young guy. I came back and said, you know, John, if if I said that, if I, if I laid that out, what that was, I, I would be acting like I was really smart. So I'm not going to do that because that will make me look like I'm trying to be a wise guy, and I don't want to come across like I know more than other people. I didn't have any idea <laughs> that it was Union City. I didn't have the first clue. And um, so that was, yeah, that was, I had a lot of fascinating experiences. I was with him for 12 years. And so it was, um, it, it was, it was kind of like the, I like the three parts of Tennessee. I sort of had three stages with him. I had the phase where I was scared of him, the phase where he basically tortured me, and then the phase where he accepted me as passable. And then after I left, we had a completely different relationship. And uh, at the end of his life, had a very different relationship as well. And it was um, it was very rewarding in all ways. It, it really was because I... I mean, he humbled me. He made sure that I knew I wasn't as smart as I thought I was. When I was 21, I thought I was really smart. I thought I was an expert at everything, especially broadcasting. I, when I was 21, I thought I invented broadcasting. And um, I didn't. For, for you know, I, I really didn't. And so uh, t- he, he made sure I knew that. And that was that was a good lesson. So when I meet young broadcasters today who think they invented broadcasting, um, you're not allowed to sort of do and say what they did to me because you'd be, you know, they would say you were cruel. And but for me, it was a great lesson. I needed it and I'm thankful for it. I don't do it to young broadcasters. But I certainly think it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Bob Kessling certainly did it when I was 21. Oh, I really thought, yeah, I had a broadcasting award and I thought it was the greatest thing in the world. Uh, <laughs> I learned after that. <laughs> yeah, well, Bob's from that school, too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he and and John did the same thing to Bob. And Bob is, I guess Bob's almost 15 years older than I am. So Bob's not going to change. I mean, uh, he he's going to you're going to come into the fraternity. In a very, and Bob did it to me, too. I mean, he. He did the same thing to me in a lot of ways. That w- it was very helpful because it's a humbling business. It's a it's a very at the moment you think you have it figured out. I mean, even today, uh, there are still for me very humbling moments in in realizing that there's always something to learn about how you do it. And then as well with John Ward, what can you tell us about his preparation process, what was important for him to have with him in the booth, whether it was the scripted ad-libs, what was important for him on the spot chart, and just what did you learn about preparation from John? He was. That's the biggest thing, that if you see what I do, you know I came from him. Because I have so much stuff ready to go for every single game, and... Um, we, two years ago, we did the season opener in Miami and we were on the air from kickoff to final whistle, seven hours and eight minutes. That doesn't count pre or post. And we were prepared to do seven hours and eight minutes because of the two lightning delays, because we had everything scripted out. I mean, John, John worked a lot more off of a spot chart than what I did and what I do. Um, The difference in in John and me, I think, in some ways, is John did not play football. John played a little bit of basketball. He was really a more insightful basketball announcer because he knew the game better. You could tell he knew the game better if you just talked to him. Football, I mean, he he knew football, but he, he couldn't tell you what a certain coverage was or what the X's and O's were. And I, I don't really know all that either. I played. So I know certain things about how you block certain plays. I mean, there are things that I know from having played um, that kind of fit me a little bit better. And so 
a lot of my prep is not as much on the spot chart. It's how I work with my spotter. The guy who spots for me is a guy named Rhett Bryan, and Rhett totally spots the defense. I spot the offense because that's where, um, having done high, I did high school for 10 years before I ever, junior varsity football, I mean, whatever. And so I didn't have a spotter. So I got used to spotting the offense, and when he came over, I said, you've just got the defense. That's all you – I said, you just worry about the defense. And so we sort of get into this rhythm based on I do this, he does this. John called the game off his spot chart. Bob Kessling, he had this elaborate spot chart, and it was built like on wood – and he had thumbtacks everywhere, and it was raised letters. I mean, it looked like something made from a craft shop on HGTV. I mean, it was phenomenal. But Kessling, when he spotted for him, he would have to put his finger on the quarterback and his finger on the tailback before every play. Then when the if the tailback got the ball, he would keep his finger on the tailback. And then he would have to reach over and point to the player who made the tackle. And, and so he's doing the binoculars in one hand. He would set that down to put his finger on the thumbtack of the guy who made the tackle. He would have to change the thumbtacks of guys when they checked in and out of the game. So if they changed tailbacks, if Smith came in the game and Jones went out of the game, he would have to change that thumbtack. It was almost as if outside of the direction the play went and the success of the play, John totally called the game off to, off what Bob was spotting. I work off the most unimpressive spot chart you've ever seen. It looks like something out of kindergarten, okay? Because I'm not I'm not as worried about that now. Hometowns and colleges and backgrounds and history and all that. I keep those. I've got a folder right over here. I keep those in a folder, and then I have everything tacked up on the wall. And I keep everything tacked up on the wall in a certain order. So when I need something, I know exactly where I'm going to turn for it. And that's how I do it. I do all a lot of the same stuff John did, but I execute it differently. That's a really long answer to your question. I apologize. But it it's what Ward taught me. And when we got through the seven-hour, eight-minute game, he was the first person that I thought of. He had just passed away three months earlier but everybody was like oh that was so great you guys did that and you know we did t-shirts for the staff you called the longest game in nfl history because we're proud of it as broadcasters you're proud of that but at the same time to me that's what we're expected to do you know that's we show up and go do the titans have a miracle left in them in what has been a magical season to this point if they do they need it now Christie kicks it high and short. Going to be fielded by Lorenzo Neal at the 25. Yeah, give pitches it, to... it back to Wycheck. He throws it across the field to Dyson. He's got something. 30, He's 40, got something. 50, He's got 40, it. 40, He's got 50, it. 20, 10, He's got 5, it. End zone. Touchdown, Titans. There are no flags on the field. It's a miracle. Tennessee has pulled a miracle. If my performance that year were a color, it would have been light beige. I, I mean, you couldn't have told anything. I mean, nobody repeated anything I said. It's exactly the way I wanted it. I wanted to be in, invisible. I wanted to learn how to do this job. I wanted to improve. I wanted to focus on these little things. So we played Buffalo in the playoff game. And I've had I've had an okay year. I've done all right. I've I would give myself a C plus. Okay. That's all I wanted. I'm awful in this Buffalo game. I'm so bad. I, I mean, I if you'd have heard me doing a junior high school football game, you'd have thought this announcer is terrible. He's horrendous. Not only would you have not thought I'm an NFL announcer, you would have thought this is a disaster. You guys know this. You have one game every year where you got peanut butter on the roof of your mouth. It just happens. That happened to be my game. Seven minutes to go in the game. I'm a, I, I am literally about to cry. I'm so upset with myself. I walk to the back of the booth in a timeout. I take a deep breath. 
And I say, okay, what did John Ward teach you in moments like this? Time and score, down and distance, who made the tackle. Let's just keep it simple. Let's do what we've been trained to do, and let's get through this thing. And if they fire you tomorrow, they fire you tomorrow. You know, that's what that's what happens. But do what you've been taught to do. And so um, I went back up and was calling the final seven minutes. And with 16 seconds to go, Christie makes the field goal. Steve Christie makes the field goal. And we get set up for the kickoff, and it ends up being the Music City Miracle Play. And they end up using our call because none, none of the other three calls that had been made could be aired due to somebody talking over one another or, you know, bad air quality or whatever, which is crazy. And it becomes one of the most famous plays in NFL history and – I have to do a press conference the next day to talk. I, only time in my career I've ever had to do press availability. And the backstory is 30 minutes earlier, I'm thinking I'm getting fired. And then this happens, but the call went okay because John taught me, and I didn't know what the call sounded like until 30 minutes after the game. I didn't even think about it. But was it accurate? Yes. It was accurate. Was it good? We can debate that. Uh, people decide that. Fans decide that. You don't decide that. But what you do is you say, it was accurate. I can live with it. And if it's accurate, that's how it goes down. And so there, for the next 22 days, we go on this magical journey. We go beat Indianapolis. We go beat Jacksonville for the third time. We play what, at that point, was easily the most dramatic Super Bowl of all time. The team sells thousands of season tickets, becomes established here, and I get to ride in the parade in a car um, the first week in February, and, and it's like, how did this happen? And now I've been here 23 years. Um, it, it's like you, you hope that you can prepare for something so at the moment where it all goes down, you just do what you're taught. And that's where you're really thankful for the John Wards and the Bob Kesslings and people who really trained you to do it the right way and, and about what's really important. Cobb is the tailback. This is Cobb. Up the middle, 20, 25, 30. Breaks outside, 35. Turns it on, 40, 45, 50, 45, 40, 35, 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Give him 6, 79 yards. one of those early inklings that oh wait a second this could be a job and then a few years later I started to get big into uh, my Tennessee football fandom and the voice of the Vols a legend named John Ward he retired that year same year that Harry Carey passed away so all throughout that 1998 year when I was 10 years old which is a pretty big year you know that's you know you get an extra digit added to your age and you're starting to you're 
having conversations with adults, just really starting to grow up at that time. Um, I just saw a retrospective tribute over and over again to John Ward and Harry Carey. And, you know, Harry can always seem like, you know, this guy in Chicago that's on national television, kind of no one can do that. That's kind of what I thought at the time. But with John Ward, it was a little different because he was the play-by-play voice of the University of Tennessee, where my dad went to school. And then he also went to school there. So, and that's, you know, an hour and a half down the road. So that was kind of the spark for me. Kelly, Kelly throws the ball, pulled down at the 35, down to the 20, down to the 15, down to the 10, down to the 5, down to the 4, down to the 3, down to the 2, down to the end zone. Touchdown, Aaron Hayes, with a sensational call as I was 11 uh, in 1991. I don't remember the date, but I can remember basically how it unfolded. Uh, My dad and I were on Highway 25E in East Tennessee. Tennessee's playing football on that Saturday, and we're riding in dad's truck, and I'm listening to John Ward and Bill Anderson. And at that moment, I knew this is what I want to do. I had played just enough football at that point and was lucky at that age to be able to understand that I was not going to be a good athlete. I played football because I was short and I was wide and I took up space. That's why I was valuable. Um, But I wasn't going to make a go of it. I was a terrible baseball player and I wasn't a very good basketball player. So my friends were all above average athletes and I wanted a way to be around them to get to spend time with them, uh, to travel with them. And this felt like an avenue that would allow me to do that. But I think a lot of credit goes to John Ward because John had great command of the English language. Whenever he spoke, it sounded like the biggest moment in the history of the world. And he could draw in people from all different backgrounds and make them interested in Tennessee football and Tennessee basketball. And he did it with me. And I knew at that point, this is the, this is the thing I want to do and just started chasing after it. And here we are close to 30 years later. And, uh, you know, it's worked out pretty well. So, uh, I'm glad that I was in the truck that day. I'm glad John was on the radio and I'm glad that he planted the seed. Certainly did plant the seed. It's one thing for you to be in the truck listening to John Ward, but what about when you had the chance to be at Big Orange Broadcasting Camp and get to hear him speak? What did he teach you in those moments? There are are three things that I vividly remember from the first time I got to listen to John Ward, and that was in 2000, so I'm 20 years old at that point. Number one is learn to love the process of preparation. And I think I've been able to get a pretty good handle on that. That's the most important thing if you're going to be successful as a broadcaster. You have to be prepared, and with that preparation comes credibility. Uh, Number two was learn the language. Uh, John Ward had a law degree from the University of Tennessee, and he had great command of the English language, would use words that were seldom used in regular conversations during football and basketball broadcasts, but somehow it clicked and it worked and it added an elegance, I think, that you don't hear in a lot of broadcasts today. And the third, although he was dead serious when he said it, is one that is somewhat comical. When I talk, everybody else in the booth shut up. And Uh, He was definitely in command uh, when when he was in the booth. And I don't think people really understand all of the things that John Ward did in addition to doing the broadcast on Saturday and on Wednesdays and Saturdays during basketball season. He was a television producer. 
he produced and and laid out and basically scripted the the large portions of those football and basketball broadcasts with regard to pregame and halftime and he was in total control uh and i think that that speaks volumes about how much detail he put in to everything that he did and again it's just another reason i think that he he was the greatest to ever do it and with him being such a strong influence uh, obviously you want to prepare like he does and do things in a similar way but how did you learn to kind of develop your own style and not necessarily try to copy everything that john did well, early on, I did copy everything that he did from from a standpoint of, of style and, and how I tried to do the games on air. Um, and I've been able to receive two really valuable pieces of advice, one from a broadcaster, one from a guy, to my knowledge, who never broadcast a game in his life. I was doing junior college basketball at Walter State Community College in Morristown, Tennessee. I was 18 years old, and all I knew was to do the games the way that John Ward did Tennessee basketball. Same pacing, same phraseology, all of those things. And one night after a game, a Morristown attorney named Charlie Terry, who was a big supporter of the college and and of athletics at Walter State, he'd bring a headset to every game. And we're walking out of the gym one night, and Charlie comes over and shakes hands, and he tells me that I'm on the right path. He said, but think about this. Think about being the first you and not the next John Ward. And that resonated at that age. The other really great piece of advice came from Chuck Cooperstein, uh, who is the voice of the Dallas Mavericks and has worked for Westwood One uh, and is a Florida guy. Uh, Kyle will quickly tell you he is a Florida guy. (laughs) Um, Chuck told me after he listened to a tape while I was at Kentucky, that I needed to try to be more conversational. And in saying that, he said, I can't tell you how to do it, but I can tell you that I believe it's what separates good broadcasters from great ones. And the greatest example is Vin Scully. Vin Scully was the most conversational, maybe of anyone who has ever done it. So Those two things I try to keep in mind, and I will tell you from the conversational standpoint, it's still a work in progress, but I do think in in the later years at Kentucky, uh, the final five years there, I started to find it and figure it out a little bit and realize that if you can go into a broadcast and approach it as a conversation and not as a dictation, there is a clear difference to how it sounds. As Sterner stumbles and falls, fumbles the football, it's been recovered by Tennessee at the 43-yard line. Sterner comes out of there, stumbles, lays the ball down, and Billy Ratliff is on top of it to recover at the 43-yard line. What else can happen, Bill, to Arkansas? What did Tennessee do, as I remember? Nothing fancy. Give the ball to number 20. Go that way. Travis Henry through the left side. This is Henry with the football. He has it at the 40. He's down to the 35. He's down to the 30 and is tackled at the 28-yard line. Tennessee's offensive line just absolutely took over the game. And once again, the give goes to Henry through the left side. He's at the 25. He's at the 20. He's to the outside to the 15, and he is out of bounds as he struggles down to the 13-yard line. This will be Travis Henry spinning, driving, fighting, carries the ball down to the two-yard line. Tennessee 8-0, ranked number one in the country, but that is not all that important at this point. What is important is 67 seconds and three yards. They need to go to Henry. This will be Martin. This will be Henry. He dives. Give him six. That's all. Touchdown, Tennessee. This football game is history, and the undefeated volunteers of Tennessee remain just that way. It wasn't easy, but it happened.